Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Tracy Cook with Sachs Healthcare Communications. I'd like to show our audience how you can send your questions throughout the webinar. Our speakers will try and answer as many as possible at the end of the presentation. You can also download today's presentation as a handout from the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel. I would like to introduce our moderator, Angela Craig. Angela Craig is a clinical nurse specialist for the ICU and the sepsis lead for Cookville Regional Medical Center in Cookville, Tennessee. She has lectured both locally and nationally on the topics of sepsis and hemodynamics. She has published on the topic of sepsis and has co-authored on the topic of heart failure. The last two years has worked extensively with many COVID-19 patients in her ICU and worked with staff on ways to better care and treat this population. She also sits on the Physician COVID-19 Task Force at our hospital and helped to update the COVID-19 guidelines for the hospital. Angela, welcome. Thank you, Tracy, for that kind introduction. The title of our webinar today is Lesson Learned, Respiratory Management of Patients with COVID-19. Speaking on this very timely topic are two exceptional experts, Dr. Ruben Restrepo and Dr. Omar Enriquez. Dr. Restrepo is a professor and coordinator of research for the Division of Respiratory Care at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, Texas. He is trained in medicine at Medellin, Columbia, and he went on to academic positions at Georgia State University and then to the University of Texas. He has published widely in the field of respiratory care, including book chapters and articles, and has given many presentations. Dr. Restrepo is a fellow of the American Association for Respiratory Care and the American College of Chess Physicians. Dr. Restrepo is a reviewer for several major journals in um, respiratory and pulmonary medicine as well. Sorry. Dr. Omar Enriquez is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary Diseases and Critical Care Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Dr. Enriquez is board certified in hospital medicine and critical care and has practiced medicine in the U.S. military community practice and academia. He was stationed at Moody Air Force Base while serving in the U.S. Air Force and was the commander of an international humanitarian mission, which served over 10,000 patients. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, he has been intimately involved in the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council's hospital and ICU pandemic crisis guidelines, as well as an advisor to University Hospital for management of inpatients and the critically ill during the various surges. As far as disclosures, Dr. Restrepo is a consultant for Medtronic, Permapure, Radiometer, Bayer, and Drager. Dr. Omar Enriquez disclosed no conflicts associated with this presentation. There are continuing education for nurses and respiratory therapists. It has been approved for 1.0 contact hours of continuing education. And at the end of this webinar, you can obtain those continuing education credits and the URL will be provided at the conclusion of this webinar. Below are the accreditation statements that you can see on your screen. And this activity has been supported by an educational grant from Dale Medical Products. And now I'm going to turn this presentation over to Dr. Ruben Restrepo. Thank you, Angela. And just uh, thanks everyone who have connected from different time zones and probably even different countries. So our intention today is to review a few of the lessons learned in the management of respiratory issues of patients with COVID. Just make sure that I have, okay. Perfect. Uh, so uh, in order to achieve this goal, uh, we have set up the following learning objectives. Uh, we're going to review the current evidence in the respiratory care management of patients with COVID. Uh, we're going to just review some of the uh, conventional issues, controversial issues that have arrived about managing patients in the ICU uh, from COVID and also describe briefly at the end some of the situations that have arrived uh, with the presence of the long COVID. So in order to achieve those goals, we have the uh, outline that you see on the screen. Uh, 
And let me just go ahead and just get started with the epidemiological outlook. So I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting that uh, on March 1st of 2020, uh, I can name a few, Armenia, Australia, Austria, Canada, Ecuador, Egypt, Israel, along with other 20 countries have reported the first 20 cases, first 20 cases, while in China had almost 80,000 cases and almost 3,000 deaths, only followed by countries like South Korea and Italy. By March 24, two years ago, the number of cases around the world surged and reached unbelievable proportions. Only by the end of March of 2020, a handful of countries had not reported a single case. And as you can see on the screen, almost every country had, had been affected by a number of waves. Only to clearly visualize just the impact of a single hour. You see here, 3, 4, 2022, 2, 2, PM. Just this is the number of cases on March 4th, almost reached. So it just in one hour, as you can see on the screen from 221, you see 150,000 case, new cases and over a thousand people dead. So only two weeks ago, the number of cases reached over 450 million cases of COVID and had claimed over 6 million lives. Something that you can observe here on the slide. So by yesterday, by 1.20 PM, the total number of cases was almost 475 million and the number of deaths increased by almost 100,000. So this is the, da the dashboard from the uh, university, from John Hopkins uh, um, Center. And now what you don't see at the end is just really a spike at the end that was not, a, that, that was not present about a week ago. So that means that based on the latest reports from Eastern Europe, we may be facing a new surge of cases around the world thanks to the Omicron variant BA2. So when we speak of the uh, of the early stages of the pandemic, so during the early stages back in 2020, uh, of course we had many issues that remained very unclear, but few things were in the mind of clinicians. As you can see, first, the sooner the patients with COVID were intubated, it appeared that the more cardiopulmonary arrests were prevented. So emerging intubation was really avoided at all, at all costs. Second, early intubation became very important to minimize the concern at that point of cross-contamination, and more importantly, the dispersion of the viral particles and inadvertent exposure of healthcare providers. So at this point, despite the, despite the paucity of evidence, the patients were intubated very often and very soon. All critical care team, uh, teams found themselves managing a very unusual number of intubated patients and probably a different type of acute respiratory distress syndrome. But in order to provide a very true perspective from the day-by-day -day clinical experience, I invited Dr. Omar Enriquez to assist us in understanding some of this firsthand experience here in San Antonio. So welcome, Omar. And I wanted to ask you, so how difficult was to the this initial approach I just described, or how different uh, to the one-year experience at your institution, but also a couple of questions. Was really the aerosolization a concern at all? And was there really an attempt to always intubate early? And welcome. Thank you, Ruben. Hello, everyone. First off, I'd like to thank uh, Tracy Cook, Angela Craig, and Dr. Restrepo for inviting me and allowing me to participate in this webinar. As was mentioned, I'll be providing my first-hand experience as it relates uh, to respiratory care of patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. But these are my experiences and, and opinions and may not necessarily reflect those of other healthcare providers within my practice, um, my academic division, or the hospital where I have taken care of these patients. Uh, so to your first question, Ruben, how different was the initial approach to the one experience um, uh, at our institution? There was no difference uh, of what you described. Our in initial approach to intubation included guidelines that had language such as criteria for uh, strong consideration of mechanical ventilation uh, because there was still a fog of uncertainty as to when to place patients on respiratory life care. 
um, life support. Um, we did go to extreme measures to avoid aerosolization. Um, in fact, uh, there was very strict protocols as to how and who would intubate the patients. Um, so to answer your second question, was, aerosol, was aerosolization a concern as well? Um, it was absolutely a concern. Um, and especially because initially we, don't, we were not clear what the mode of highest transmission was. Um, but extrapolating from our knowledge from other coronavirus infections is what guided our initial approach. Um, we did attempt to intubate early, uh, often. In fact, our initial guidelines uh, defined severe pneumonia by several following factors, one of which was a failure to oxygenate despite appropriate supportive measures um, or intolerance of the interface or devices that were used. And in fact, we were even considering failure of, of um, oxygenation with saturations uh, less than 94 uh, percent, which is not your typical cutoff to intubate somebody, but um, because there was a concern of avoiding uh, cardiopulmonary arrest or having to undergo an emergent intubation, we set these thresholds uh, as such. Thank you, Omar. Uh, and I think the, the other issue of importance that came alarming to critical care teams was the fact that Several researchers at this point, including the world-renowned Dr. Luciano Garinani from Italy, uh, had already described a different type of ARDS phenotype and a clinical pattern with COVID. So significant differences were observed at this point regarding the presence of diffuse alveolar densities, the PF ratio, different lung compliance, the presence of systemic inflammation, and even in the radiographic pattern of both the plain film and the chest tomography. And, and of course, these descriptions brought very high interest to the clinicians trying to determine the best way to ventilate these patients. So without the question, the physiological perspective at this point of managing these patients with COVID-related associated ARDS brought interest, uh, interest and of course, significant challenges. One particularly uh, unique histologic feature that you see was the presence of the microthrombi in the alveolar capillaries of the, as indicated by these arrowheads, in this 78-year-old uh, uh, patient who unfortunately died uh, from COVID. So as we can imagine, after intubating a significant number of patients at the beginning of the pandemic, the number of available medical me mechanical ventilators was very poor around the world. And this for sure became one of the many tipping points in what the morale was going to be on by all the healthcare providers. So selecting at one point, if you can imagine, who would be placed on the mechanical ventilator and who, would, and who wouldn't, uh, would determine actually who may survive and who for sure would die. So the invention and provisional patents for new mechanical ventilators did not come fast enough at this time of the pandemic. So I would like to, to ask uh, Omar, so how difficult was it to find all the resources required, uh, particularly during this uh, several, several waves? And where were, where, what were the most uh, significant challenges for you and your team at this early stage of the pandemic? So coordination between healthcare providers that were at the bedside and knowing what we needed at the bedside um, and coordinating this with the executive administration leaders who oversaw the approval of, of obtaining these resources was the most difficult part. Uh, for example, at one time, uh, we were nearing the use of all our available ventilators. Um, I tried to facilitate borrowing ventilators from a local hospital who had excess ventilators and was willing to lend them. Uh, the coordination of this was very difficult, uh, if you can imagine, just from the um, uh, labeling of these ventilators, the transportation of these uh, ventilators, uh, inventorying or keeping an inventory of these ventilators, both at the lending facility and the receiving facility, and making sure that their maintenance and return was secure uh, was a large endeavor. Take also into consideration the large numbers of equipment that was needed and not and that was just the ventilator itself 
uh, although the process was complex and it was difficult and laborsome, uh, we were successful and, and uh, never had a situation where we ran out of ventilators or needed to um, allocate or invoke crisis standards uh, to uh, place someone on an on a ventilator. Yeah, that wasn't that wasn't the case for many institutions, as we know. So, I think you were uh, very uh, privileged in in that regards. So, as we moved uh, uh, to 2021. Uh, the evidence came about uh, showing conflicting data. So at this point, uh, some of the studies were showing that if the patients were intubated, their odds ratio of dying were significantly greater as compared to those who were placed on non-invasive respiratory support strategies. So the, the real question at this, point, at this point became, is the ventilator really helping or is it ventilator-induced lung injury in combination with a really bad ARDS, just simply a recipe for Dying for dying patients in the uh, with COVID, so the high mortality on the ventilator now combined with the evidence showing a low risk for aerosolization and very limited transmission of the virus encouraged clinicians to really use non-invasive respiratory support as the first line of treatment for patients with COVID. So the number of reports with now larger number of patients had demonstrated at this point that early versus late intubation was not associated with differences in outcomes. So in this article uh, published this year in the journal Curious by a group of Albanian researchers, the, uh, show, so yeah, the Kaplan-Meier shows that although there was a trend to improve survival in 128 patients with COVID after early intubation, the difference was not statistically significant. So this report, along with similar studies, drove actually a reduction of the intubation rates by 20%, and non-invasive respiratory strategies was initiated and sustained until patients displayed significant work breathing or were unable to speak. So now, Omar, I have a question for you in regards to this uh, point of transition. So how long did it, really, did it really take for your team to change the practice from to implementing non-invasive respiratory support, such as high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation or BiPAP? And was this driven by the shortage of ventilators or the upcoming evidence, the upcoming evidence or both? Yes, so initially there was a slight delay in implementing the use of non-invasive respiratory support. Um, we have a group of providers, uh, physicians and advanced practice providers that are military trained and we're frequently thinking outside of the box on ways to oxygenate patients aside from intubation. And at the same time, we had providers that were willing, uh, uh, that were reviewing the data expeditiously and giving us this real time feedback as fast as possible. These providers were also brave and were willing to be the first ones to try alternative ways of oxygenating aside from intubation. Um, high flow nasal cannulas and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation are modes that we frequently use before the pandemic and that we have come to be quite competent and experts in their use. So matching all these facets uh, of our practice let us to soon implement and recommend their use in the entire hospital. Um, I would say there was some hesitancy at first because of the uncertainty of, of how dangerous this was. But again, uh, as I mentioned, all these facets of of having uh, data expeditiously reviewed and guiding us as well as our previous uh, experience with coronavirus infections um, kind of led us to implement these, these modes of vaccination. So to directly answer your second question, it was driven by evidence, innovation, and bravery rather than uh, a shortage of ventilators um, or a delay in the evidence being available. Thank you, Omar. So, and speaking of oxygenation targets, uh, so who hasn't heard the term happy hypoxia? So, happy hypoxia has been defined as the presence of oxygen saturations 80% and below in patients who appear relatively comfortable with no clear uh, signs of distress. So, in this diagram, the presence of edema, uh, diffuse alveolar densities, and shunt. Uh, 
and of course, uh, yeah, the shun re just results in a, the presence of the rapid shallow breeding, uh, leading to hypo hypocapnia. Uh, the beauty of the hypocapnia is that it really preserves the cerebral blood flow. So it was not an issue to see this patient with no confusion and no anxiety. But I think on the other hand, what you can see is that this, uh, the, the presence of this rapid shallow breeding was leading to severe hypoxemia and cyanosis. So as, uh, as reported by C and others in 2020, uh, with patients with COVID-19, it was found that the severity of hypoxemia was independently associated with in-hospital mortality and became an important predictor that the patient was at risk of requiring admission to the intensive care unit. So there, there have been uh, several clinical oxidation indices, but uh, there's one in particular that had been used or has been used to predict the outcome of patients with COVID, which is the ROX uh, index calculated by multiplying the SPO2 by the FiO2 and dividing it by respiratory rate. As you can imagine, the lower the respiratory rate, the better number you get, the higher the number, so the better prognosis. And in a, in a recent uh, meta-analysis uh, by Joe High and colleagues, uh, in, uh, nine, in 1,933 patients, uh, which, of which 38% failed high flow nasal cannula, the results showed that the ROX index could be a novel marker to really identify patients with a higher risk of high flow nasal cannula failure. Others like the group in Bologna, uh, Italy, had used more conventional indices to predict, as you can see on the right, a failure to conventional therapy and confirm that parameters such as SpO2, body temperature, PaO2, lactate, um, uh, AA gradient, uh, and the ROX index were highly predictable um, of failure to conventional oxygenation on patients with COVID. So Omar, I was just curious exactly as to which oxygenation parameters were more important to the ICU team uh, during this time? So certainly the ROX index was very useful and it was an objective marker for us to guide uh, triaging patients that were on the floor that required ICU admission and even uh, were anticipating to fail uh, high flow oxygen administration. Uh, but looking uh, more so at this, we looked at the individual factors that compose that comprise the ROX index. So we learned that the respiratory rate and the trajectory of that respiratory rate as the treatment progressed was very important. Uh, so if that respiratory rate main, was elevated consistently despite several days of treatment, uh, that alone, even perhaps a ROX index that was uh, did not meet uh, concerning criteria, that alone was concerning for us to to hint to us that they would probably require intubation. The work of breathing and the subjective character of that work of breathing by the patient was also important. So if the patient, for example, uh, would describe a work of breathing that was minimal, but it was obviously very uh, uh, laborsome to us, but the patient felt comfortable, um, we would perhaps be more reserved about pushing the patient to consider intubation. Um, however, if a patient was breathing, uh, work of breathing was not that laborious, but um, the variable oxygenation respiratory rate were very elevated or abnormal, that would uh, lead us to uh, suggest intubation uh, rather than not. So, how rapidly a person recovered from a desaturation was also very important. So if they were able to recover quickly within a matter of seconds uh, with moderate or even heavy exertion, um, those were good signs. But if they had a delayed recovery from say, just moving in bed from one position to another, and it took him several seconds to minutes to recover, that was concerning. Um, another factor was obesity. Um, obesity was a significant factor for us to consider intubating uh, patients if, if they were requiring higher escalating levels of oxygen support. And finally was the tolerance to various modes of oxygen delivery. Uh, if they tolerated high flow, nasal cannula, or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation with, and we would try different uh, types of masks, nasal masks, full face masks, et cetera. <clears throat> 
Thank you, Omar. And we will talk a little bit more extensively about the uh, non-invasive devices. So, so now let's uh, let's turn uh, over talking about uh, awake prone positioning. So, uh, and there's no question that many of the tricks that use regarding proning have been learned from previous experience with arch patients. Uh, it's been almost again 10, 10 years since the Perceva trial. So, but in the particular case of awake uh, prone positioning, the world turning was more important than the full prone position. So some patients, uh, if you think about proning, just being completely spont or spontaneously breathing or fully awake, uh, we're very uncomfortable. Uh, others also experience anxiety or required uh, just light sedation to tolerate the appropriate position. So with these factors in mind, care providers had to ensure that patient did not fall asleep and they were turning at appropriate times intervals to ensure that they were having no complications like uh, pressure ulcers or hemodynamically instability. Uh, this article by Chan this year in Frontiers of Medicine, in Medicine uh, describes the protocol and the benefits obtained by implementing the awake proning positioning in patients with COVID-19. Uh, also, you, as you can imagine, there's no question that this technique became a bit more challenging for patients with non-invasive devices uh, I guess thank God we don't we don't use so much the helmet in the in the Americas, but then South America and Europe are heavy users of the helmet, and this became a little bit more challenging for these uh, interfaces because uh, they were more uncomfortable. Uh, so that's why some some places actually opted to choose high flow nasal cannula over uh, non invasive ventilation uh, with, via mask in these particular cases. Now. In this particular study published by Lancet uh, in 2021 by uh, Ermon and colleagues in over 1,000 patients managed with high flow nasal cannula for hypoxemic respiratory failure due to COVID, they report how awake prone positioning reduced the incidence of treatment failure and the need for intubation without any significant complications. And as you can see on the diagram, on the uh, illustration, the figure, that those uh, effects were actually sustained after the uh, uh, return to the supine position. And this slide is just an example of the similar reports in the literature supporting awake prone positioning for patients with COVID-19. But I, I think, interestingly, interestingly, the implication of early versus late intubation was not the only clinical decision that was tested and again, in many instances, in this article by my good friend David Vines and colleagues at Rush University in Chicago, they demonstrated via retrospective analysis of 129 patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure due to COVID that early, that means in the first 24 hours of using high flow nasal cannula, awake prone positioning was associated with a better 28 day survival. So it's important to highlight, so these figures, again, from a couple of studies on the previous slide showed how uh, early awake prone positioning was associated with a significant better SpO2 FiO2 ratio, a higher ROCS index, but also as an overall treatment success on this right side of the screen. So Omar, uh, we all talk about proning, uh, we will talk about intubating patient, intubated patients and proning, uh, but there's a say that it takes about 10 people to prone a patient, four to actually do it and six to actually panic or complain about it. So I'm just curious in the ICU at UH, uh, had, do you have a proning team in the ICU? And really, without really providing details uh, on the protocol, was proning uh, easy to implement this time in the ICU for spontaneously uh, breathing patients? <laughs> yes. Uh, so we did not have initially um, a proning team, but uh, as the volumes of patients started to increase, we did create a, a, a proning team, dedicated proning team. Um, our nursing and respiratory staff were well versed and trained in proning. Uh, using standard hospital beds as well as specialty beds. So it was not a tool that was difficult to implement. Uh, in fact, we had used and have used uh, proning as a, as, a, as a mode to oxygenate, to improve oxygenation um, in intubated patients for, for a very long time before the pandemic. But to actually uh, 
suggest that or implement that with patients who are not intubated did require a little bit of work because it was uh, something that was not customarily done outside of the ICU. So uh, initially we had some education to do with our hospitalist partners and we did instruct them and teach the nursing staff how to uh, teach the patients themselves how to self-prone. And then um, if the patient did require ICU level care and subsequently intubation, um, these same nursing teams would then go around patient to patient and uh, prone them as well as meeting certain time benchmarks, rotating them, moving them to prevent any uh, skin breakdown or, or injury. Thank you, Omar. So, uh, so now that we just turn, and again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about just uh, proning during uh, intubated patients, but let's speak about, about high flow uh, nasal cannula and its highlights. So, uh, as shared before, there were initial concerns about the aerosolization of viral particles during the early phase of the pandemic, uh, and this actually prevented many clinicians to placing patients on high flow uh, nasal cannula. But then its effectiveness was studied, like this uh, systematic review by Agarwal in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia in 2020, demonstrated that could reduce the need for invasive ventilation and escalation of care compared to conventional oxygen therapy. But also, as you can see at the end of the conclusion, this benefit had to be balanced against the unknown risk of airborne transmission. Remember, we're talking about 2020 at this point. So what became actually more appealing as the pandemic progressed in 2020 was really compared to compare high flow nasal cannula to non-invasive ventilation. There it comes again. We just didn't need the pandemic to do to create this situation. But now, so what this systematic review published this year by Glenardi in Indonesia found better outcomes with high flow nasal cannula compared to non-invasive uh, ventilation for COVID-related acute respiratory failure in about 268 patients as shown here how it, it favors high flow in this scattered plot at the bottom of the slide. But to temper the excitement, of course, of early uh, early and heavy adopters for high flow nasal cannula, it had to, we had to be reminded that late failure to the use of high flow nasal cannula could result in very poor outcomes, including high mortality in COVID-19 patients. So same, same warning that we have seen with any non-invasive respiratory support strategy that is used beyond the time when the patient should have been intubated to start with. So Omar, uh, again, we get, when we get to this point of using non-invasive respiratory strategy, so high flow is one of those strategies that some centers really love and heavily adopt while others do not. So what was your experience with high flow in the ICU uh, with severe hypoxemia prior to the pandemic and how did it change if it changed at all during the pandemic? Sure, so as I mentioned previously, we had been very comfortable using high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And in fact, uh, we used it regularly before the pandemic. We began to use it more frequently outside of the ICU by hospitalists, um, albeit sometimes it provided a false sense of security in some populations. For example, uh, using high flow nasal cannula would offer oxygen saturations 98 to 100 percent, but those same patients would have horrible PF ratios or would have marked increased work of breathing or uh, very abnormal um, uh, um, ROCS indexes and uh, would take several minutes to recover from desaturations uh, that would occur during very light activity. So providing this high level of oxygenation and describing the patient a happy hypoxic patient um, would give some uh, physicians that weren't uh, very familiar with high flow nasal cannula um, a false sense of security just because their oxygenation was maintained uh, relatively well. But uh, so to answer your question uh, in summary, um, we had used it very uh, readily uh, and ubiquitously uh, prior to the pandemic and continue to do so. Thank you, Omar. Uh, I think something that I learned a long time ago from Dr. Andreas Esteban from Spain is that 
if at any point in the first 30 minutes, there is not really a turning around of your patient, you should be thinking about intubating it. So that's why the, those first 30, 45, one, minute, one hour, just at the bedside, just instituting non-invasive uh, respiratory strategies, so be, it is going to be so critical. So, so now let's, uh, again, speaking of the devil, let's review the use of uh, non-invasive ventilation during the uh, pandemic. So I think the same concerns that we had about high flow nasal cannula had existed. The existing evidence associated with its use in patients with ARDS at this point um, uh, with non-invasive didn't help in many cases to be initially selected for patients with COVID. If you remember, I mentioned that delayed intubation to be a significant risk factor for patients undergoing both high flow nasal cannula and non invasive ventilation. Uh, everyone knows that there are significant advantages to non invasive, but similar questions to the selection of settings on mechanical ventilator uh, now circulated about, uh, about NIV. So, which EPAP, how much IPAP. Uh, what kind of support should we use in regards to FiO2? So many questions uh, we had in mind. And then trying to determine uh, when to use non-invasive was going to be the same case as we used before when patients actually turned to be hypercapnic or acidotic and when they fail a uh, high flow nasal cannula. So I also wanted to bring just Omar to, to the table here uh, to talk about, yeah, these two issues. And, uh, you, you have mentioned this before, Omar, but so high flow, the, yeah, the bottle is, or the war, I could say, between high flow nasal cannula, because keep in mind that the FDA now considers high flow nasal cannula not as a oxygenation uh, device, but also is also a non-invasive device. So where did your team actually draw the line between using high flow and, and non-invasive? And for your COVID patients, was there really a significant, significant dis difference or impact when you use one versus the other? Yeah, that's, that, that's been a very interesting transition um, in, in this uh, type of care of, of our patients. What we have observed is that um, for the most part, outside of the ICU, um, high flow nasal cannula had been used to its maximal effect, meaning um, FiO2's oxygen set uh, levels of 100% at 55 to 60 liters per minute. And these levels uh, are often used for uh, days on, on some patients, as long as they're tolerating it and their physiology uh, is, is, is stable. Um, and then once they have started to show failure of this mode of oxygenation, then they transition to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Um, oftentimes this transition is not well supported or not well done. For example, if a patient is having pure hypoxemic decompensation and is ventilating well, uh, the transition that we prefer to utilize and that we encourage uh, hospitalists and providers to uh, do outside of the ICU is to transition from high flow nasal cannula to uh, a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation using CPAP or a, um, a constant positive airway pressure. And to begin, at a lower setting. So as you know, high flow nasal cannula will provide some degree of PEEP, uh, about two or three centimeters, uh, there about of uh, water of PEEP, of uh, positive ind uh, indexpiratory pressure. And so when a patient is having pure hypoxemic decompensation, um, transitioning from high flow to non-invasive positive pressure uh, is best done using a CPAP mode rather than a bi-level mode. And we suggest that when this when this transition occurs, that you start off at very low settings. Typically, on on the um, BiPAP machines, the lowest setting you can set is about four centimeters of water, which is more peep than you will would have been getting with non-invasive. Uh, I'm sorry, with uh, high flow nasal cannula. So starting off with a CPAP of four, letting the patient become acclimated to this flow of air coming into their face. And once the patient is acclimated to this positive uh, airway pressure, then you can titrate the pressures upward, or if you need to, you can even start to titrate the FiO2 downward. Um, it's not uncommon to see patients sometimes on high flow nasal cannulas that are breathing uh, 40, 45 times a minute, and they are in maximal settings, meaning 55 liters per minute at 100% FiO2. We transition them from the high flow 
to CPAP at four centimeters of water, start off usually about 100% FiO2, and then you start seeing the respiratory rate start coming down slowly uh, into the into the mid 30s, lower 30s, mid 20s, and they start taking bigger, deeper breath, a lot slower breath, and you can start titrating the FiO2. Of course, this is a different approach to a patient who has both oxygenation and ventilation issues. If you have both of those, then you may want to consider a bi-level mode initially. But again, what we encourage is to let the patient become acclimated to that uh, new way of breathing with that flow of air coming uh, into the patient's face. Um, and so uh, as far as what had been our threshold to initiate uh, transition from high flow to uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. It really had been the other indices that you mentioned earlier, ROX index, respiratory rate, recovery, et cetera, all those things. Thank you, Omar. So I think there's a, there's no question that uh, this continues to be one of the hottest topics in, in the literature because ultimately all we want to do is um, just try to avoid as much as we can uh, intubating this patient. So again, just a lot of uh, literature just coming up in regards to this. And I think the benefit is just uh, seeing one one of these issues. And by the way, uh, just one emphasis on just the importance of just uh, non-invasive ventilation use, non-invasive non -invasive ventilation use in patients with COVID is very relevant. Uh, but what this has provided is uh, essential tools like algorithms or protocols that will try to benefit any any type of critical care team uh, just to provide uh, better uses of the resources. So now we we have uh, just the last topic just before we just make some comments on long COVID. And of course, is the use of mechanical ventilation. And I think there's no question that, uh, yeah, I don't personally think that COVID patients uh, would require at this point an approach uh, uh, that we don't have to most patients, which is when they have cardiac hemodynamic or oxygen-based situations, nobody's really thinking about what is the best mode, the best settings is just trying to compensate those issues prior to uh, uh, selecting what are going to be what we call the ARDS targets. I don't think you see on this slide anything, something that is, com is going to be so unconventional to what you have seen in the management of patients with ARDS. Uh, so for example, in this article by Lance uh, published almost two years ago, the authors review uh, this, uh, different ventilatory strategies for COVID patients and suggested really an approach that included all the known steps in the management of ventilated patients using a lung protection strategy. So when zooming in into the ventilatory management, we find the well-evidenced parameters to clearly prevent ventilator-induced lung injury. So now, Omar, we get to this, again, basic slide where we have this confounding uh, just evidence that could be controversial, high, low, but I really just wanted to just point out to something uh, just because now we're just uh, kind of just trying to wrap this up. But so really, how, how different was this uh, management of patients with COVID-related ARDS and conventional ARDS. And if I can ask you just to just make a brief comment on the use of neuromuscular blocking agents for pa patients with COVID. Sure. So I would say that overall, uh, looking at your table, um, there was no real difference of how we manage the patient on the ventilator. The only difference is the rapid progression of hypoxemia and refractoriness of hypoxemia and how frequently we had to institute rescue modes of oxygenation and ventilation in these patients. It seemed like the ARDS was uh, much more rapidly progressing than our pre-pandemic ARDS patients. Um, one thing that I did want to highlight that we did learn and I think it's helpful, uh, especially for uh, those providers that are, are involved in the intubation process of these patients. Um, and that is the profound hypoxia and the delayed recovery of these patients once induction and paralysis was instituted as part of rapid, uh, rapid sequence intubation. Um, what, what we saw was these patients were borderline hypoxic on either um, 
high flow nasal cannula with a combination of a oxymask or non rebreather or even on non invasive positive pressure ventilation. And once you gave the medication for rapid sequence intubation, their hypoxia would become very profound. I can recall several instances where patients would get hypoxic down uh, within a matter of seconds down into the 40s, 30s. And, um, and of course, everybody was very anxious and panicking trying to get the patient intubated during those brief seconds. Um, so a couple of things that we did learn, I think are very helpful uh, uh, information to share with everyone is number one, to expect it. Um, they, these patients will get profoundly hypoxic just before you place the endotracheal tube and you do begin to ventilate them and oxygenate them. And the second is to try to recruit early after endotracheal uh, intubation. Um, so what we do is after the medications are administered and the endotracheal tube is placed, uh, we give several slow, large breaths using the AMBU bag uh, with an attached peep saver. And what we do is we typically set the peep to around 10 or 15. And as we administer each breath, uh, we squeeze the, 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 the AMBU bag a, a little bit larger than we otherwise would. And we hold that squeeze, we hold that breath for about three seconds, one, two, three, and then we slowly release that breath. And what we've noticed is that that recovers, that um, recruits the, uh, the lung very nicely and brings that profound hypoxia right back up within a matter of seconds as well. So um, what, we, what we've done is, is instituted this um, carefully. Of course, there's still the concern of aerosolization. So we do put HEPA filters uh, as an interface between the ET tube and our AMBU bag, as well as HEPA filters in line with the vent circuit as well to give us some protection. But um, using this early recruiting maneuver has seemed to help patients recover from this profound hypoxia uh, very nicely. To address your, your second part of your question about neuromuscular blockade in, in uh, COVID-19 patients, um, it has been uh, frequent, helpful, and detrimental all at the same time. Uh, we have had to use neuromuscular blockade as a mode to improve oxygenation and sometimes to obtain synchrony and comfort with the ventilator. Um, and we seem to use it uh, almost, I would say nine times out of 10 on all our patients that require intubations initially, at least at some point. Um, and so it's, it's been frequent and helpful in that regard. Unfortunately, it's also been detrimental because as you know, with prolonged paralysis, you subsequently develop a profound and severe critical uh, illness, myopathy, and weakness. Uh, add to that the degree of sickness that the patient is experiencing, uh, not just for days, but for weeks, uh, can be very profound to the point where uh, the patients are completely immobile and need aggressive physical therapy um, after, uh, if and when they recover from their acute respiratory failure. And let me just uh, keep you here just to make it just a, uh, just a few comments about proning. I just we're nearing the end of the program, but I wanted to ask you because I mean, I've seen proning before. Uh, we know exactly what the procedural trial just brought us. And sometimes we want to say that the evidence best practice should be practiced. But even from my own experience uh, with uh, just with, uh, with the students uh, doing research and even serving fellows from different countries, we know that sometimes the procedural protocol uh, it's not exactly at here 100 so uh, kind of just a yes or no question omar is uh so was the compliance or adherence to the protocol to the procedure protocol almost 100 percent uh, even with the available resources that you had no it wasn't and uh just if if i may to add the reason for that was uh because uh, sometimes these patients would require prolonged period of proning uh, even beyond the the uh, the prescribed uh, time frame, and so um, they that was their really their only mode uh, of of maintaining oxygenation and synchrony with uh, with the ventilator. And sometimes as well, there was development of skin injury, so sometimes we would have to shorten that duration as well and do it more frequent. 
Uh, so to answer your question again, no, we do not adhere strictly to the guidelines. Yeah, I know it's, it's been a challenge for everyone. And I think uh, just recently at a critical care conference, conference that I attended uh, clearly showed that the typical proning time in days was unusually higher on this particular patients. So we are just getting to the last point. I uh, just briefly comment uh, what we already know and we have learned uh, all the way from SARS, which is the long COVID. And again, our article after article just continue to prove that COVID-19 uh, could be really devastating in regards to long-term issues for organ function and quality of life. And now as, as we cross the two year line of the pandemic, we are still beyond the point of knowing how long patients with really COVID will linger and require uh, healthcare. So I'm going to end by reading a statement from the University of Oxford researchers. Compared to the general population, people who have been hospitalized for COVID-19 and survived for at least one week after the charge were more than twice as likely to die or to be readmitted to the hospital in the next several months. I think it is devastating. So more research is of course coming up, uh, but I think we are just seeing the type of the, ice, the, the tip of the iceberg. And we have to wait until more data arrives to provide us with a better outlook for what is coming. Uh, Omar, your final thoughts on what, what we're expecting from long COVID. Yeah, so certainly, um, when someone has a severe disease from COVID-19, just like any other disease, the physiological reserve that a person has, a patient has going into that, into that disease is going to contribute significantly to the recovery um, and the overall long-term uh, prognosis of that patient. Um, there, the uh, long COVID syndrome is, is very real. Um, it is uh, interesting to see success stories of patients who uh, were deathly ill and recovered um, and have even recovered beyond their long COVID syndrome. Um, I believe that, that uh, the overall health of the person mentally, spiritually, and physically uh, is a big factor in how a person um, is going to survive uh, this low, long COVID syndrome. And uh, what I mean by that is, is that I've taken care of some patients that have been hospitalized, intubated for weeks, um, close to uh, months, and have had a prolonged and, and profound weakness and a long recovery from this long COVID syndrome. Um, but with adequate resources for recovery to include family, um, physical therapy, occupational therapists, specialists, psychologists, um, all the resources possible, uh, the patients uh, can do well, um, and they do well. In fact, it, it's um, very comforting to receive uh, videos and notes from patients who uh, I've taken care of over the last uh, several years with COVID, um, and seeing them at one point intubated or with a tracheostomy, unable to care for themselves, and then receiving a video of them uh, playing the drums or or uh, a a uh, a uh, action camera as they're riding their bike um, has been very um, satisfying and 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 um, um, and uh, very helpful. Thank you, Omar. So this has ended our presentation, and uh, let me just turn this back to Angela. Well, thank you, Dr. Restrepo and Dr. Enriquez. Um, this was a very informative session. I enjoyed it. And I would like to inform our viewers how they're going to be able to obtain their CEs for this session. So this activity has been programmed and approved for 1.0 contact hour. Continuing education is for nurses and also respiratory therapists. And you can obtain those continuing education credits by logging on to www sextesting.com forward slash p. You will need to register on the test site and complete the evaluation form upon successful submission and you will be able to print your certificate of completion. And once again, this activity is supported by an educational grant from Dale Medical Products.
An archived slash on-demand version will be available on www.perspectivesinnursing.org and an email will be sent to all registrants when it is available and the on-demand version will be accredited for CEs. So now we're going to get to the questions. Oh my goodness, we've got some great questions. And I'm just going to start with the first one that um, someone had asked. Um, what is considered normal, a normal ROCS index for COVID patients? Omar, you want to take that one? Omar, you're muted. Omar, you're still muted. I'm not sure, uh, Dr. Restrepo, if you wanted to jump in. Hmm. Angela, let's go into the next question, and I'll work with Omar. Okay. Okay. Yes. And the next question is in regards to. Um, um, one of the questions was, what have you all seen with regards to INO and or inhaled pulmonary vasodilators? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, uh, the question about inhaled nitric oxide and uh, pulmonary vasodilators, yeah. So we've used them. Um, unfortunately, the data does not show any uh, significant improvement in uh, mortality um, and overall uh, outcomes. It does improve your numbers, so it will improve your, your oxygenation and your O2 saturations. And the way we've utilized them is uh, as a way to bridge, to uh, consider um, either ECMO or uh, as a bridge to see if there is something that we can fix that will help the overall um, um, uh, trajectory of, of the patient's oxygenation. Excellent. And I'm sorry, in, just in regards to the question about the rocks, so again, yes. the higher the number it is, but uh, if you want to just remember a cutoff, uh, so in regards to the high flow nasal cannula, it rocks with at least 4.8 or greater is associated with success from high flow nasal cannula. So just below again, below 4.5 and so forth, that's when you start just getting concerned about the uh, how critical it is and the cutoff between using non-invasive ventilation and just proceeding with the intubation. Excellent, thank you. Um, someone, uh, Jerry, uh, mentioned in 2009, um, he had participated on a committee at a hospital in Pennsylvania where they were evaluating and selecting pneumatically driven disposable emergency ventilators for a pandemic. We were told hospitals around the country were doing the same. My question, since the 2020 ventilator shortage panic has been, um, what happened to those stocks? It's a very good question. I, I remember uh, talking to actually your boss, uh, Dr. Dr. J. Peters Omar. Uh, the new ventilator was already just uh, on board in Austin. I don't think I don't think those ventilators. It's funny because by the time we had an explosion of, of ventilators just coming up after just a uh, quick patent, uh, the surge actually came down. And it became relatively manageable with the number of ventilators. So initially, by just the end of two, I mean mid 20, 2020, uh, the end 2020, it became extremely chaotic, and that's when all the ventilators just came about. But then, that's when, when you look at the waves, that's when the surge dramatically came down, and it seemed to be that all the teams were deployed to back to the stations, and there was no need to use so many of those ventilators. I don't know if you you actually had a chance to to use Omar. Any of those vents? I don't. I don't. I don't remember getting that report. No. What What we did do is we we began to look into some of those um, uh, early vents uh, and did consider uh, purchasing them or obtaining them in the event of an emergency. But like you mentioned, the timing of the surges were such that we were able to uh, backfill 
or fix our broken ventilators uh, to supplement the ones that we had. In addition to that, we have all, we had also planned to utilize some of our non-invasive positive pressure ventilators as um, invasive ventilators uh, under a pressure controlled mode. So um, that was one of our strategies to optimize all our machines uh, to use the non-invasive machines as well uh, as a pressure controlled mode. Okay, excellent. We're going to go over just a few minutes because we just have such excellent questions. Um, what roles do nebulizers play in the treatment of COVID-19 for patients without a history of pulmonary disease? Yeah, so I'll 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 address that one. So first off, uh, you know, it one thing I want to emphasize that was very important for the overall survivability of COVID patients is your run-of-the-mill standard bread and butter, good COVID care. All right. At first, there was a lot of uh, uh, concern and fear about doing uh, uh, pulmonary toilet, what we call pulmonary toilet, uh, doing suctioning, deep suctioning. Um, uh, easy pap, uh, uh, IPV, um, anything like that. But as we started getting more comfortable with these therapies, um, I strongly feel that that was the mainstay that helped uh, a lot of these patients survive. With regards to um, uh, bronchodilators like albuterol could be used uh, for pulmonary toilet, some patients that did not have any history of airway reactivity, COPD or asthma, did develop some degree of respiratory reactivity with viral infection. So sometimes we did find it helpful to use uh, the bronchodilators as part of the pulmonary toilet in addition to mucolytics and aggressive uh, pulmonary toilet to make sure that there were no mucus plugging or atelectatic lung that would be developing. Yeah, interestingly enough, I mean, there's some studies even about just nebulized uh, diuretics I mean, the use of the uh, furosemide, for example, just for the anti-inflammatory and cytokine control. But again, it's not the standard of care, as Omar has mentioned, just for pulmonary clearance and just a bronchodilatory effect. That's where you may see without really affecting outcomes of COVID patients, just simply managing whatever uh, signs you have of uh, hyper-responsiveness. Excellent. And the last question, I just couldn't turn this question down. It said, I had COVID in January of 2020 and ended up with an inflammatory cardiomyopathy, was initially diagnosed with isolated cardiac sarcoid in May of 2020, and AICD was placed in July of 2020. Since then, my diagnosis has changed. Have you heard of more cardiac involvement like this in long COVID? I have found several others with the exact same scenario as myself. I am an RRT in Detroit who worked through this surge. Yes, unfortunately, um, there has been uh, similar uh, cardiac sequelae from, from COVID-19 infection. Um, as you all know, there's also association with um, cardiac uh, inflammatory uh, effects from vaccinations as well. So uh, yes, we have seen that. One of the interesting things that we've seen uh, almost ubiquitously in, in, in the ICU is the profound bradycardia um, aside from hypoxia, not related to hypoxia, but the bradycardia that uh, is, is present in some patients. And again, also not associated with sedation, uh, just a profound bradycardia. Um, we've also taken care of some patients who have survived COVID uh, early infections and subsequently have developed conduction abnormalities as well. So uh, yeah, that, that's another area of pathophysiology that is, is, is continuing to be studied at this time. Yeah, unfortunately, one of those things that we probably learned from SARS, it was exactly the same issue. Cases of myocarditis, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, and just lingering symptoms up to 18 months, 24 months. I don't think we see the exception here with COVID. It's kind of the same picture. I think you're right. Well, thanks, you guys, so much. I'm going to turn this back over to Tracy. It's been a great um, lecture. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you to all of our speakers today. 
We would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Immediately upon the conclusion of this webinar, you will be presented with an online survey. Please keep your web browser open and we appreciate your feedback. For the CE Certificate of Completion, in one hour following the conclusion of this webinar, you will receive an email with instructions and this link to obtain your CE credits. www.saxtesting.com backslash P. And again, we thank everyone for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your day.